share with you that we've been in this Christmas sermon series for four weeks. This is our fourth week, and we've learned about how our past informs who we are from the ghost of Christmas past. We learned how to be in the moment from the ghost of Christmas present, and now we hear Scrooge's journey with the ghost of the Christmas future. And I have to tell you, the ghost of Christmas future just frightens me right to my very bones. He is completely shrouded in a dark black robe. Nothing is visible except one outstretched head with an ominous finger that just points to all that Scrooge should learn. What makes this ghost even more gravely mysterious is that he never speaks, not one word. The ghost of Christmas future is completely silent. Silence can be awkward, don't you think? Have you ever experienced one of those long, uncomfortable silences that kind of ends a conversation? At best, at best, the conversation has just ended and that silence is just people regrouping as they prepare for, to start off in a new direction, to talk about something new. But at worst, at worst, it is a stunned silence because the conversation has gone <coughs> wrong. You know, someone has told an off-color joke. They have um, said a racial slur or they have engaged in some kind of malicious gossip. I think the very most terrifying silence of all, though, is one that expresses shock and disbelief because you're getting news that you just don't want to hear. You know, like silence that follows a doctor's diagnosis or the knocking on the door by a policeman in the middle of the night or your spouse telling you, that your marriage is over. Scrooge was fearful of the spirit's silence and even more afraid of the things that the spirit showed him. <coughs> the ghost of Christmas future took Scrooge to the shady side of town into a shop of used goods that were piled high, you know, rags and housewares and hardware and tools and other rusty treasures. And he was so disheartened there to witness his charwoman and his laundress and his prospective undertaker selling the goods of a dead man. Silverware and cufflinks and clothing, even the sheets and curtains from the dead man's bed. And they did all this without any emotion, no grief, no guilt. And so Scrooge asked, is there somewhere, someone in town who feels emotion for this man's death? And the ghost took him into a home. But there was a husband and wife who were quietly rejoicing because this man's death meant a reprieve from the onerous debt that he hung over them. And so Scrooge said, is there any place where tenderness is connected to death? And the ghost took him into the Cratchit's home. And there Scrooge learned that Tiny Tim had died. He learned and felt the family's heartbreak, but he also saw the legacy of love and joy that Tim had given them. And as much as Tiny Tim was remembered with love, Scrooge learned that he would die alone in the dark, empty house without one man, woman, or child ever remembering one kind word coming out of him. And faced with this empty end, this emptiness caused by his love of money, Scrooge cried out, Spirit, are these shadows of things that will be? Or are they shadows of things that may be only? And the ghost remained silent. The future.
future is not certain. And we just don't predict it. <coughs> this week, the Wall Street Journal carried a whole section that kind of looked back over the last 10 years at predictions made and how they came down. And their lead article was about interest rates. It was titled, Economists Get It Wrong. <laughs> so when the financial crisis ended in 2009, the economists were so sure that slowly, the interest rates would climb back up to just over 4%, about 4.5%. But it didn't happen in 2010, it didn't happen in 2011, it didn't happen in 2012, and yet every single year they kept predicting it. Folks, it's 2019 and rates aren't up to that 4% level yet. Another article in the same journal expressed surprise that we are still so divided politically, culturally, and economically when healing was predicted. The entrepreneurial experts incorrectly predicted which startup companies would succeed, and meteor meteorologists failed to forecast the correct strength and direction of many storms, and who knew? Who knew that the nationals would win? <laughs> The future is unknown, terribly unpredictable, and awaiting every single one of us. We are left wondering, in uncertainty, the answers to life's big questions like, will I find someone to marry? Will I find a job that will fulfill me? Will I be able to earn enough and save enough that I will be able to retire someday? Will the test results come back benign? We shout these questions from our unknowing hearts and yearn for answers. We yearn to hear from God. And what we hear is, well, just sometimes we hear nothing. That silence is unnerving when we are so desperately in need for an answer. When we pray to God and hear nothing, it can leave us with that uneasy feeling that God has turned away or that God can't be bothered with our questions. Matt Rowell, the author of The Redemption of Scrooge, the, one of the books that kind of founded this sermon series, suggests that the silence can be the sound of God listening. Now think about that for a moment. When you come home from a trying day and you start sharing your day's adventures with your spouse or your sister or your loved one, <coughs> you don't really want them to jump right in before you finish and start telling you how to fix it. Just want them to listen with compassion. Their silence shows respect. It shows that they're truly listening to you. <laughs> silence was really important in the conversations with Jesus. For example, when the Pharisees brought this woman accused of adultery to Jesus and asked if they should go ahead and stone her, he was silent <coughs> for quite a while. In fact, he was doodling something in the sand. When he, then he finally said, let the one without sin cast the first stone. And you know what? No one could do it. They walked away <coughs> in silence. <coughs> Another time, Jesus was at dinner with the fair at a Pharisee's home, and there was a man suffering from some kind of swelling, abnormal swelling somewhere in his body. And Jesus asked the group, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And then in the silence, he healed the man. Christ's most profound silence was before Pilate. It was a silence that invited all of humanity into the redeeming suffering on the cross. Usually, though, Jesus' ministry was not met with silence. It usually was kind of controversial and often divisive. It, it elicited all kinds of strong emotions, both positive and negative. 
Early on, he returned to his boyhood town of Nazareth to worship with his people on the Sabbath, as was his custom. And when it was his turn to read, someone passed him the scroll of Isaiah, and he opened and read this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And he has sent me to release the captives and he recover the sight to the blind and let the oppressed go free <coughs> and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he went on to comment on how Isaiah's prophecy had been fulfilled in their hearing, you know, fulfilled through him. And the congregation's response were divided. Some thought, oh, man, he's grown up to be a great preacher. And others were angry, and they forced him out of town. The sermon that he preached echoed Isaiah's teachings on prayer and community care. So while we are encouraged to pray to God often and to ask for what we need, Isaiah compared the people's prayers to a chorus of trumpets. We need to listen to the voices around us as well, Isaiah said. As soon as we cry out for justice, we are to treat those in our household with the same justice and work to free the oppressed people. We are to share our bread with the hungry. We are to house the homeless. We are to clothe the naked. And then our light, the light that will flow from us, will be like the dawn and our healing will come quickly, suggested Isaiah. Jesus loved all people. But he especially cared for those forced to the margins of life because of economic or social or racial or religious standards. Silence can be an invitation for us to listen to the other voices around us that are yearning to be heard. Who in your household needs to be heard? Is it the young person who no longer wants to sit at the kiddies table and needs to hear from you words of encouragement that acknowledge that they are still your beloved child, good and acceptance of the adolescent that they are becoming? What about the person that works all day and just needs to vent their frustrations? What about the person that's been in the kitchen and the laundry room and pushing the vacuum around the house, doing those daily, weekly chores that just needs some appreciation and acknowledgement. <coughs> what about the senior? <coughs> Just wants to be seen and heard and valued. Or maybe there's someone that has not yet been invited to your table. Someone lonely for friendship. Someone who needs to hear your stories of faith. Jesus came so that we would know what God is like. His ministry included those on the margins of life. He listened to and valued all people. He offered forgiveness and new life, a new start. If you're hungry for the light of Jesus, then go to where he is, to those in need. Our answers for life's purpose and passion can be found while we are listening and serving. If you hear only the sound of silence, keep praying and listening because there's something more in that conversation. <coughs> Scrooge was afraid to journey with the ghost of Christmas future, but he did so because he knew that the ghost had purposes for his good. Scrooge hoped to learn to live in a new manner so that he could keep the spirit of Christmas well. We are also imperfect people on a journey, learning to live and love well. And Jesus promised 
to be with us every step of the way. God has given us the power to live each moment well. And we have an ability to make a difference. We can leave a legacy of love. Our future may be unknown, but Christ knows us and will hold us, especially during times of silence. Amen.